Hi, it's Dr. Katherine Harris again, English 10, Great Works of Literature and Techno Literature. For today's installment, we're going to pick up talking about Robert Louis Stevenson's 1886 novella, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, with the full title being The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Now, last week, what I talked to you guys about was, in particular, the characters, the plot formation, the narrative itself, and then we got into discussions about morality, first-degree murder, second-degree murder, and the division and autophagy and, and doppelgangers and talking about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde himself. Then I engaged you in uh, group sessions to talk about how you would conduct a trial, and you've been working on that over the weekend. On Thursday, you'll present a mock trial, and for next week, you'll write it up in a collaborative essay. But in the meantime, I'd like to highlight a few quotes and a few pieces of evidence in the statement of Dr. Jekyll at the very conclusion of the novel and talking about technology, moral responsibility, um, efficacy of the soul, feelings, things like that. One of the first things that I'd like to point out is that this is an 1886 published novel in London. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson was Scottish, with so there was a, a long history of a preclusion with um, uh, the Scottish authors are really being fascinated with this idea of duality, duplicity, and double consciousness. Now, this had been something of a rage all throughout England and America because of Darwin's 1859 publication of The Origin of Species. And I hope you've heard of this before. If you haven't, you can certainly look it up on Google Books. Now, Darwin is most famously known for talking about survival of the fittest, but really, in actuality, what he was talking about was evolution and this idea that genes went out of any particular species that proves that it can survive in any given situation. Now, when we talk about the British Victorians, which ranges from 1832 to 1902 when Queen Victoria dies, we're talking about the Victorians every decade they were different and they had a major influence on the rest of the world, primarily be because Queen Victoria built up this huge armada that was then able to uh, create trade routes uh, all over the world. And so they were able to commit to imperialism and colonialism and raping and pillaging um, other cultures, but also spreading those cult cultures all over the world. Now, what Darwin did was go to travel on the Beagle. Uh, and it was a ship, and he traveled to the Galapagos Islands and observed all of the animals there. And then he equated uh, the sense of evolution from animals over to human beings. Now, what Robert Louis Stevenson gets us to is a Victorian concern with recidivism, which means a relapse to crime. And what is contemplated throughout the entire novel in all the witness statements and all of the confessions, every written document, every oral statement, was a sense of people witnessing crime or people being part of it or being victims of a particular crime. And we can include Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in both of those. So there was a sense for Dr. Jekyll to try to divide the good from the evil side of humanity and to evolve in a way so that humanity was more good and more benevolent. And this means that he's assuming that Mr. Hyde is essentially evil. So I'd like us to turn for this particular lecture to a few questions. This is Dr. Jekyll's experiment to separate human beings, one good intention, from an evil intention. Does the experiment fail? The use of science to bi biologically separate good and evil in the soul is efficacious for human beings to be able to do this? Or should they have to learn tabula rasa, meaning that they're blank slates and they choose between good and evil, much like Victor Frankenstein's creature? Or would they eventually learn not to be as evil as they were? The Victorians were really taxed with uh, overburden and overcrowding in prisons at this particular time because they were arresting everybody for anything. There was a, a lot of uh, working class woes that were going on at this particular time. So we have a class structure. I'm not sure that much has changed when we talk, start to talk about California prisons uh, here in the United States. Let us turn to, in this edition, page 49, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the suicide in that particular moment.
I just want to read this to you. At this particular moment, this is in the narrative called The Last Night in that chapter, and it's Poole standing there saying that, that she's heard something and that there is, um, or he's, he's heard something, and that he can't tell if it's Dr. Jekyll or if it's some other voice. Uh, and Utterson cries, that's not Jekyll, it's Hyde. And they hear it and they uh, run and burst into the door. And what they see on the floor is this. Right in the midst there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with a semblance of life, but life was quite gone, and by the crushed file in the hand and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. Suicide. But it's suicide by chemistry. Science. Technology, biotechnology. So we have our instance very early on that Dr. Jekyll is going to use potions both to make himself a better person by dividing the evil out, that's Mr. Hyde, but then also destroying Mr. Hyde and himself at the same time. The next thing I want to go to is on page 51. It's the confession. Henry Jekyll writes a preliminary letter before you actually get his statement. And he says... My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared. Note right here that Jekyll never says dies, he just says disappears. Under what circumstances, I have not penetration to foresee, but my instinct and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure and must be early. So not only does Dr. Jekyll separate out Mr. Hyde and create a new being, but he's destroyed himself. How is this different than what Victor Frankenstein did? So keep that in mind. Go then and first read the narrative which Landon warned me uh, he was to place in your hands. And if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of himself. And so we have a confession of Henry Jekyll here. Think about this when you're putting up your mock trial information. On page 58... This is in Dr. Lanyon's narrative. We have science that is being witnessed. We have a conversion, but it's a physical con conversion. The bottom of uh, 58, he put the glass to his lips and drank one gulp. So we have evidence of the science potion. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched at the table, and held on, staring with injected eyes. And we go to the end of that particular chapter, and we see what he told me the next hour. I cannot bring my mind to set on paper. I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard, and my soul sickened at it. So Mr. Hyde creates this physical repulsion in people when they see it, but also uh, Lanyon talking, discussing and talking about the actual conversion from his friend to somebody he doesn't recognize at all. He says, the creature who crept into my house that night was, on Jekyll's own confession, known by the name of Hyde and hunted for in every corner of the land as the murderer of Carew. So we have a recognition. We have an eyewitness. And then we also have a physical manifestation, the first one really of Hyde. And then we have Jekyll's statement starting on page 60. And he breaks down his statement in a very interesting way. It starts as, as, as if it's not a narrative, as if it's a confession. And then on page 61, we move into the science of it. Now, Henry Jekyll at this particular time says that he had learned to dwell with pleasure as a beloved daydream on the thought of the separation of these elements of the good and the evil. Now, though he's a doctor and a science man, he seems to revel in feelings, something that we would think would be antithetical to natural philosophy and to the sciences. He also says on 61, it was on the moral side in my own person that I learned to recognize the thorough and primitive duality of man. And this is where we have this idea of evolution, the primitive man versus um, the very refined man, which we think that Dr. Jekyll is. He continues in this particular confession just below the feeling quote of talking about this idea of good versus evil as if they cannot coexist. And in the final paragraph on that particular page, he discusses a lab. So we're setting up a scenario where we're about to experiment. And if we turn over the page into page 68, we'll see that we actually have a formula and a potion. The very top of the page, 
The power of the drug had not been always equally displayed. Once very early in my career, it had totally failed me. Since then, I had been ob obliged on more than one occasion to double and once with infinite risk of death to double the amount, and these rare uncertainties had cast hitherto the sole shadow on my contentment. And he continues down and talking about it. One of the things that it's a concern here is empirical evidence. He wasn't able to repeat the scientific experiment with the same degree of replication and results over and over again. So we don't, we have him with unknown elements. In fact, one of the elements is from, some from foreign land that we don't know about. If we go back over to page 61, we see that we, he continues to chronicle the lab that he's set up everything in. On page 62, we receive the theory behind why he's conducting these experiments. Uh, I even nothing that I not only recognize my natural body for the mere aura and efflu effulgence of certain of the powers that made up my spirit, but managed to compound a drug by which these powers should be dethroned from their supremacy and a second form and countenance substituted nonetheless natural to me because they were the expression and bore the stamp of lower elements of my soul. Science instead of religion will get rid of the evil in his soul. There is no religion, no ritualistic practice throughout this entire novel. It's a reliance on biotechnology in order to make man a better human being. In the next paragraph, he chronicles the testing of it. I hesitated long before I put this theory to the test of practice. I knew well that I risked death. He's practicing on himself. That would violate all kinds of protocols that we have in place these days. You do not do human testing before you do animal testing. On page 68, we return to it's that same area, also in the Henry Jekyll's statement of the case, this idea of the, the test and the theory. All things, therefore, seem to point to this, that I was slowly losing hold of my original and better self and becoming slowly incorporated with my second and worse, the outcome. This is what happens in every scientific experiment. On page 64, we see that he starts to chronicle his own feelings and emotions about this freedom he experiences with Mr. Hyde. At the bottom of 64, in the full paragraph, he says, Even at that time, I had not yet conquered my aversion to the dryness of a life of study. He doesn't necessarily enjoy being this refined and to being this philosophical and scientific. I would still be merrily disposed at times, and as my pleasures were, to say the least, undignified, and I was not only well known and highly considered, but growing towards the elderly man. This incoherency of my life was daily growing more unwelcome. It was on this side that my new power tempted me until I fell in slavery. I had but to drink the cup to doff at once the body of the noted professor and to assume like a thick cloak that of Edward Hyde. Edward Hyde was younger stronger and was outside the bounds of social mores and also of the law it seems hint hint there he resents his own age dr jekyll the experiment becomes uncontrollable as is chronicled on page 67. I must have stared upon it for near half a minute, sunk as I was in the mere stupidity of wonder before terror woke up in my breast as sudden as startling as the crash of cymbals, and bounding from my bed, I rushed to the mirror. At the sight that met my eyes, my blood was changed into something exquisitely thin and icy. Yes, I had gone to bed, Henry Jekyll, and I had awakened Edward Hyde. How was this to be explained? I asked myself, and then with that, another bound of terror, how was it to be remedied? It was well on in the morning. The servants were up. All my drugs were in the cabinet. The experiment is no longer within his control. And there, he has not written down the formula for the potion, much like um, Victor Frankenstein didn't write exactly down and tell his readers how to create a new human being. There was a fear of replicating this particular experiment by the rest of society. We also want to note that Henry Jekyll named Edward Hyde. At some point, it wasn't just a, a homunculus. It wasn't just a doppelganger. It was a completely separate identity that Edward Hyde assumes that Henry is completely subsumed into. This is where our autophagy comes up. 
On page 76, we see further evidence of this uncontrolled experiment, and in, this is what I love to do, the beginning of the novel and the end of the novel. I always say that the end of the novel and the beginning of the novel, whoever is speaking, that's the person who controls this particular novel. And he says, in this end, as he's about to extinguish himself, will Hyde die upon the scaffold or will he find the courage to release himself at the last moment? God knows I'm careless. This is my true hour of death and what is to follow concerns another than myself. Here then, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Henry Jekyll to an end. What? Henry Jekyll is being brought to an end. Who's speaking here? Hyde or Jekyll? Does Jekyll kill himself, in which case it's suicide? Or does Jekyll kill Hyde, in which case it's murder? Or does Hyde kill Jekyll? That's for you to find out in your jury trials. And you have to ask yourself, in the end, does the experiment fail? I've posted the instructions for not only the mock trial, but also the essay. There's a series of charges that you may choose amongst yourselves when you conduct the trial. It doesn't have to be necessarily murder, but you might consider all of the charges, especially as the jury. Take a look at the instructions for the jury trial and the write-up itself. I'll be online during our regular class session from 12 to 1.15. You can find me on Twitter or Skype. If you find me on Twitter, be sure to use the hashtag TechnoLiterature if you have any questions, or just pop up over onto my office at Faculty Offices Building, room 220. I also have regular office hours from 2 to 3 p.m. Just show up whenever you want. Enjoy, and I'll see you on Thursday for the mock trials.